Hey there, how's it going? Uh, my name is Josh, I'm one of the pastors here at ABF. We know that there are a number of different people that tune in both near and far. We know that uh, there are some of you that are just traveling, miss the weekend services, and so therefore you're tuning in online. We also know that there's others of you that are around the country and even around the world that are tuning in uh, just to get some good Bible teaching, just diving into God's word. And we would just say, man, our heart is that everybody would be connected to a local Bible body of believers that meets together in real life. Um, don't get me wrong. It's great that you're coming here and getting into God's word. And I think that's amazing. But man, our hope is that you would be a part of a local church. And so uh, we're very happy to su supply this. But man, that's our heart for anybody and everybody watching. We just wanted to put that out there as we get started. A couple of things. Uh, if there's anything we can pray for you about this week, we would love to do that. You can text any prayer request to 97,000 and we will pray for you this week. If you're interested in any of the things that are going on locally here at this body of believers in Agora Hills, California, go ahead and check out the website, agorabible.org, or get the app. We have a church center app and find Agora Bible Fellowship. All the information of things that are going on, you can check out there. Finally, thank you so much uh, for prayerfully considering uh, financially supporting all the ministries that are happening here. Literally, we couldn't do what we do. We couldn't have our doors open. We couldn't put on these uh, videos and uh, be sharing God's word via online messages like this without people like you that give. So thank you so much for um, prayerfully considering that. We appreciate your partnership in that. That being said, why don't we just get into God's word together. Let's go. Well, greetings, church, and welcome to another online service. And this online service is uh, unique because it's our uh, Palm Sunday uh, service as a church family, and I'm uh, glad you're able to join, join us for that. Well, I uh, wanted to just share a story as we start in our uh, talk here today, a story that I was reading that a friend shared on Facebook. It just really uh, caught my attention because I thought it was such a neat one. He was, the story was about in uh, Chicago. There's a particular uh, gym there. And the gym was having a problem because the same guy kept sneaking in and trying to co come into the gym and playing basketball without a membership. His membership had expired quite a while back. And so they eventually got to the pl place where they had to call the police about it. Well, one particular cop was assigned to show up and uh, investigate and assess the situation. And after uh, kind of uh, talking with the person that was sneaking in, just a young man, he discovered that his uh, single mom uh, had uh, allowed the, the gym membership to lapse because she just couldn't afford to keep up with it. So it's kind of a cool story because the, the cop, instead of actually arresting this young man or whatever was to come, he instead pulled out his wallet, decided to cover the next six months so that this kid could have a membership to the gym. Kind of a cool story. And it, it continued on with the gym owners. They discovered that this had happened and they're like, man, this is cool that he was doing that. And so they added on to it, added the next two years of membership uh, for this young man to continue in the gym. Now, I know it seems like it might seem like a small thing, not that huge of a story, but something about stories like that kind of pull our heartstrings a bit. And the reason that I think that they do that is because I think they scratch the surface of what God's design was for us. The life that he intended us to live, it, it pushes back against the selfishness that so much of our world is consumed with. The, the me, me, me mentality. You see, God demonstrated in Jesus Christ what selflessness was intended to look like. And you see, as we're heading into Easter week, it's probably the most uh, clear demonstration of anywhere in Scripture of what selflessness is intended to look like. In fact, Jesus himself explained in John chapter 15, he said, No greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. So, Leading up to Easter, one week out, we're going to spend a little time looking at and getting to familiar with the selfless demonstration of love in Jesus, even as it was leading up to the arrival at that cruel Roman cross. Let me pray before we dive into this section of, of the book of Mark. 
Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this chance to gather around your word and thank you for uh, what this time of the year demonstrates. We get a, a glimpse of all that you've done for us. Not, not because uh, it benefited you, but because you care so deeply for us. I ask that you would speak to us through this section of scripture, that our eyes would be opened. And really, if, if people walked away from this passage with a, a clear understanding of the, the extreme radical love that you have for your children, and that would be an amazing takeaway. So I pray for that right now. I pray that that would be rooted in our minds and hearts coming out of this message. We pray that in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, well, we're going to look, and there's options for different accounts of the triumphal entry, but we're going to be looking in Mark chapter 11, and starting in verse 1, it's kind of a, a, a fairly clear portrayal, describes what took place. It says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you, why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing, untying the colt? And they told him what Jesus had said, and they let them go. All right, I want to pause there. Now, it seems like some maybe unnecessary, silly details, but if you think about it, it's really a picture of Jesus' ability to see things and know things before they happen. Now, to me, that's always been an idea that's fascinating, all the way from back to the days of, of back in the future, back to the future movies with Marty McFly and, and Biff and, and Dr. Brown, all of those things, uh, reminisce of, of what would that be like to actually know exactly what was going to happen before it happened? I think it would open up tons of options. First off, you could make some really good stock choices, I imagine. But secondly, and probably uh, equally important, you could avoid so many pitfalls. Knowing what was going to happen, you could uh, avoid a lot of pain, a lot of misery, a lot of discomfort. There's a lot that you could avoid by your ability to know things before they're happening. Now, add to the equation what we see here demonstrated in Jesus Christ. Not only did he know what was going to happen, he had the ability and the power to alter situations. What has he asked his disciples to do? He asked them to go into a town before he's even arrived there. He knows exactly where this, uh, this colt, which is a, a, a young donkey, where this would be at, where, where it would be located, that it would be tied up that there'd be people that would question it. And he told them, and to me, and you can read this differently, but when he tells them, listen, the, the Lord wants to use it. And I kind of get this picture if you're a Star Wars fan, kind of like a Jedi mind trick. The Lord needs it. Just forget what you saw here. And they're like, all right, take it. Because normally people don't typically just give up something of value. But in this situation, Jesus saw what was coming had the ability, ability, as demonstrated in lots of different aspects of his life, to alter the situation, what does that leave you? That leaves you with a God who's omnipotent, that, that knows everything, and is, un, or is able to, to alter anything, uh, extreme power at his disposal. And to me, when you consider this, as he's marching into a city, that most certainly meant that most certainly meant he would be killed. It was a it was a known fact that there was a hit on Jesus. Knowing that tells you a little bit about where he was at with his love for us. See, I think it's important, even as we start this account of the triumphal entry, for us to understand that his choice to march to the cross was intentional. There was no accidents there. It wasn't like he got caught off guard. It wasn't like he was shocked by his circumstances. He knew exactly what was happening. He knew what was coming ahead of time and still headed there because why? What would compel that kind of love? 
I was just talking with a, a friend over lunch this week about kind of the, the love that you have for your kids. You're like, I don't really understand it because they can be so annoying at times, but there's something that's inside of you that's just, that's, that's a part of who you are as your kids. There's just something about them that you're just like, man, I would do anything for them. For us to understand and to combat some of the lies that sneak into our thinking that you start to assume that, oh, I'm, I'm unlovable. I'm not loved. I'm, I'm unlovely. The, the, all, all of those things collide with the understanding of what scripture points to here that Jesus doesn't think that. He sees you as lovely. He sees you as lovable. Otherwise, there's nothing that would have been strong enough to drive him to that cruel cross. But here he marches towards the city is the first picture that we see. It's pretty cool demonstration of his power of foreshadowing or forecasting exactly what would take place. Verse seven, it says, and they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. Again, as I mentioned, as we were starting, there's different accounts that help fill in some of the blanks here. I think uh, John's account helps us understand a little bit more of what was taking place here. John 12, 14 and 15 says this, and Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it just as it is written. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. What is happening there? What is it saying? You see, this was something that was foretold, that was prophesied over 680 years prior in Zechariah 9.9. It talked about the Messiah coming and arriving on a colt. It's kind of cool when you start to pause and think all of these different things that were over 300 different prophecies that Jesus perfectly fulfilled about his life. Some of them you say, well, he could, anybody could choose to ride in on a donkey. You can control that prophecy. But what about prophecies about his family line? What about, about prophecies about where he was born? A lot of things that you wrote, don't really have say over or control over. But here he chooses to walk, to march into the city on a colt. And what did that represent? What did that actually mean? What we do see in scripture is God never misses an opportunity for a powerful symbol, something to represent something else in scripture. And there's a number of things that him riding into the city on a donkey represented. The first that might be maybe less obvious, the first is understanding that in the Old Testament, there was different things that foreshadowed this coming of a Messiah and a sacrifice that was to be made by all. In the story uh, all the way back with Jacob and his son Isaac. Do you remember that? When God asked, Isaac, asked Jacob to sacrifice his only son as, a, as an offering before the Lord. He would put, what did he do? He ended up putting Isaac on a donkey, taking him up to be sacrificed. Again, a foreshadowing of the sacrifice that Jesus, as God's only begotten son, would come in also as the perfect sacrifice. Second thing that the donkey represented is in times of war, and this is worth repeating, I know I've mentioned it before. In times of war, a, a king, after conquering a city, would come in on a, on a prancing stallion, a, a white horse like we see in a lot of the movies. That would be a, a picture of his dominance and, uh, and strength and power. And this time, uh, the opposite would be true, where during a time of peace, where there isn't war, you would arrive on a donkey. That would be the, the, the pace that they would be going at. There's no need for the prancing stallion. So it was a, a symbol or a picture of peace, which was a little bit of Jesus clarifying expectations because they were hoping that he was going to come and, and, and usher in rescue from Roman dominance. But instead, he's coming as a place, as a, a picture of peace. I think it's also clarifying expectations for us, for his arrival, even what it meant to our own lives. John 3, 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. 
I'm afraid sometimes we have a false picture of God as this angry judge that's wanting to rub our nose in our sin, but he wasn't arriving to bring, to, to usher in uh, consequence. He was to, to, coming to arrive to bring peace, to provide rescue. It's an important picture of what was taking place even in this description of what he was writing. The third thing, the third reason for a donkey, and you can probably add to this list, in that time period, period emissaries would send a, a donkey overloaded with gifts to appease the wrath of their enemy. Basically, when they're outnumbered, when they're in a jam, when they're, when they're just about to be taken over, there might be one last ditch effort to say, all right, well, we're gonna at least try to send gifts to appease their wrath against us. So they'd send donkeys loaded with any kind of a, a peace offering to somehow divert the wrath of the more powerful nation. If you think about that played out being symbolic of what Jesus was doing is Jesus was the peace offering before God. Jesus was the, was the effort that was the attempt to, to uh, offset the hostility that was created by our sin. See, if you think through the gospel message, our, our sins separate us from a perfect God and we're headed towards judgment. And Jesus is that peace offering being offered on our behalf. A lot of cool things, if you think about it from that idea, even playing that out, what is Jesus doing? Jesus is, is actually rescuing us from himself. Think about that. He's, a, he's like, I'm the offering to satisfy the justice that I demand as the judge of the earth. So lots of cool things pictured, even in that act of riding in on a colt. We'll continue in the text. More neat stuff. It says, And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. All right, so let's, let's remind us of what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with a people group that's under heavy Roman rule. What did heavy, heavy Roman rule look like? The, probably the most impactful thing was the loss of freedom. And probably the second most impactful thing was the fact that they were being taxed heavily. So imagine you're under a, a, a governing nation that wasn't, that wasn't a your people group. If it was as if a, a nation came in outside of the United States and overtook the United States and they taxed us heavily, they took away our freedoms. What would you naturally be hoping would happen? You're like, man, I just want to be set free from this. Well, they think as Jesus is coming in, they think, man, this is the, the perfect scenario. They're hoping he's going to be a, a conquering king that, that makes things right. And really up until this point, he's kind of fit the bill with his demonstrations of power, with him speaking with authority and leadership. Basically, when he's coming in during Passover, it's like, man, this is the prime time to usher that in. Why is it the prime time? Think about what Passover is. It was the time where they slowed down and remembered God's deliverance from the Egyptians. Remember the way he had provided a way out, a, a rescue, if they will. Now Jesus is showing up and it's at the time that there's over two, two million Jews present in Jerusalem. That's what some of the estimates. So if there was ever a time to rally the troops, this would have been the perfect ideal situation. So they're waving palm branches, which was a, a symbol of Jewish nationalism. It was kind of their, uh, like our version of an American flag. So picture that. They're, they're waving palm branches. They're, they're uh, wanting to usher him in as the new king and leader. They're spreading their cloaks, which was basically symbolic of them uh, submitting to his authority, saying, all right, wh whatever direction you want to take us, we're willing to follow. Even shouting, messianic accolades. Listen to what's said. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. 
Everyone knew that the Messiah was from the line of David. So they're, they're saying, man, we, we want you, we, we want to see you come and usher in this kingdom that we've all been waiting for. This is a demonstration of submission. This is a, a rallying of the, of the masses. They're hoping this is the deliverance that they had long been waiting for. But here's the thing. Jesus sees straight to the heart. He knows that these are fleeting fans and not genuine followers. What do I mean by fleeting fans? I don't know if you're like this. Some people are fit what they describe as fair weather fans. When a team's doing well, they're like, all right, I'm going to cheer for that team. But as soon as they start doing poorly, yeah, they're on to the next team. I'm sometimes guilty of that, to be honest with you. But what that, the dis difference of that is, is a genuine follower, at least in this case with Jesus, is somebody that isn't altered by circumstances. It's not like if you, it's not this exchange. If you do this for me, then I'll do this for you. But instead, it's a commitment. And Jesus saw right through that and recognized that a high percentage of the people in that group that's shouting Hosanna in one week's time will be shouting the opposite, will be yelling, crucify him crucify him. You see, that's one of the things we have to understand is that God sees straight to the heart. He sees who's genuinely in and who's just a, a fair weather fan. Basically, they're wanting the, him to rescue them from their miserable circumstances. But the truth is a lot of times people like that idea of rescue, but don't like the idea of actually having to do what he says. Continue in the text. It says, And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now, this again doesn't give us the full and complete picture of what's happening there. When he's entering into the city, there's something else that takes place. Luke chapter 19, verse 41 actually describes what happens upon his arrival. It says, And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. Now, imagine this scene. Now, upon first reading that, you're like, oh, that's, that's kind of odd. That's kind of strange. But think through what's actually taking place. This is a huge celebration party for him. Now just imagine for a second if you're that person. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put Michael Lubin, who actually does our, our video stuff here uh, behind the scenes. You would rarely ever see Michael Lubin. So I'm going to put Michael on the spot. Michael, you want to come up here? Now, Michael, just for a moment, imagine if you're here and everybody is going crazy, just cheering your name. Michael, Michael, it would be hard to keep a straight face. And I'm guessing that if everybody was here, if this room was packed, like it hopefully will be on Sunday, and they're all cheering your name, you would probably have a pretty big smile on your face, don't you think? But instead, there's nobody here cheering your name. So go ahead and back and have a seat. But honestly, think through that. What a big deal that would be when everybody's shouting and cheering. You would expect, oh, finally, if you're Jesus, you're like, finally, they get it. They understand who I am. They, they recognize that I am the Messiah. They finally, the, it's something has clicked in their brains. But instead, like I mentioned, he saw straight to the heart. He saw the difference between fans and followers. He saw the truth behind what was going on and it made him weep. I don't know. There's just something about that picture that I've just been just kind of processing through this week. The picture of Jesus Christ riding on the colt. This is the, the God of the universe in the, in the flesh, in the form of a man, riding into this town, riding into that. Now, most people would be excited about this moment and fame or whatever. We look for our 15 minutes, but that's not Jesus. Instead, he's something that, somebody that genuinely, his heart broke for us. Like, I, I love this picture of, of his compassion for us. And it says that he, he literally wept. Just pic, picture the, uh, Jesus himself, that this was such an emotional thing, knowing what was to come, that, is, that the, the tears were just flowing from his face. To me, 
as we're going and re taking time re to remember this triumphal entry, to remember that it actually was more than a triumphal entry. It was a picture of the compassion of Jesus for you and for I. It's a, it's, it's a beautiful picture of the Messiah that he cares deeply for us. He says, oh, that you would have known the things that make for peace. Oh, if you would have known that I wasn't trying to rescue you from your circumstances. I was trying to address something much more important is your relationship with your God. So many times distracted with the same thing. Continue in the text. We're going to jump a few verses rather than me explaining uh, him cursing the fig tree right after that. It's a cool story. You can look. We actually have spent time in other uh, sermons addressing that. But jumping to verse 15, it says, And they came to Jerusalem, and this is talking about Jesus and his disciples, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him. For they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when, he, and when evening came, they went out of the city. Interesting interaction there, if you think about it. It's a funny thing because it actually confronts some of the confusion that happens in our world present day. What I would suggest some of the confusion that's in our world present day is about how the uh, love is to be demonstrated. A lot of people conclude that love is one of those things that's more of like a coddling kind of love, a, a love that's affirming regardless of, of how destructive and misdirected the person is in life. So one that's like, that's okay. Uh, that I, I, whatever's best, whatever works for you, go ahead and go that direction. In fact, our culture, in fact, if there's any opposition to the direction that somebody's going, any pushback, we're saying, oh, well, that's not very loving of you. That's not, that's not very uh, embracing for you. But here's what Jesus points out to us. He dealt with the exact same thing, that he did not have an issue addressing when people had derailed, when they'd won wandered from his design, from his plan of what he has put in place. And in this instant, he has no issue confronting what was happening as it related to worship. Back in verse 11, we're told that he looked around at everything. He looked around at everything. Then he went home and he took some time. He went to Bethany. He took some time with, with friends to consider what he had seen. So he didn't come back. And as a, a, this isn't an emotional hothead response. This is a calculated thought through response to what was observed. And what he observed that he realized is that the, the place that was designed for, for worship had become a den of thieves. They were using it as a means to make a profit. What is it, what was happening? It's actually something that I've explained before, but it's worth re revisiting. In those days, the people were expected to pay a temple tax every single person once a year. And the most natural time to bring that temple tax was when they were there for the Passover. That was the time that they would all be in the city. So what they had set up in the temple courts and the, the outside of the temple is they had set up all of these money changers and the people buying and selling uh, potential uh, sacrifices. First thing that needed to be addressed was with that temple tax, in order to pay the temple tax, they had to use a currency that didn't have the king's face on it. Well, the people in the temple working there were so helpful. They would offer 
for the ex- exchange of a coin for the, for the no good uh, Roman coins, they would offer, here's a, a coin that doesn't have a leader's picture on it. So a suitable coin for their offering to be made in. But that exchange rate, what they described as a, in, in Jewish history is that exchange rate was about equivalent to a day's worth of wages. If you put that in the present day uh, income, that would translate to about $270 for this exchange rate for each and every person that was coming there to worship. So that's the first thing. So they're, they're cashing in on that. The second thing, as he's saying that he, they're moving the pigeon holders out. You're like, what, is, what do pigeon holders have to do? Basically, you, every person was also expected to bring a sacrifice. For somebody that was wealthy, they would bring the sacrifice of a lamb. And so they'd have the opportunity to buy lambs that were in the stalls in the temple that were perfectly clean. They were pre-screened to be without blemish. Well, if you bought a lamb or, a, or if you bought uh, something outside of the temple, it was most likely gonna be deemed unclean by those. So people just most likely gave up that idea and just purchased the overpriced things within the temple. Now, the part that probably makes that an even sadder thing was the people that were considered impoverished or poor, they were allowed, instead of bringing a lamb, they were allowed to make the sacrifice of a pigeon. Now, this was the the crazy thing, is that what they were doing is these money changers and the people had set up to see, again, pre-screened, clean pigeons that could be purchased within the temple. So they were even taking advantage of the poorest of the poor of that culture. So Jesus has, has, wants nothing to do with that. So he cleanses, he starts turning over tables, confronting them, using this as a teachable moment. What does he teach them? He says that he drives them out, but he explains to them his design, his intention for or his expectation for the, ch- for the place of worship to be a house of prayer for all nations. Now, two things to observe from that, a house of prayer. The first thing is that it was intended to be a place when you think about prayer. What's the intent behind prayer? Prayer is intended to be something that allows us to commune with God where we're sharing our, our thoughts, we're sharing our, our plans, we're making requests, we're, we're praising him. There's the, this communication, this, this uh, last month, as we've mentioned a number of times here, we're going, we went through this 30-day uh, fast. And that doesn't mean not eating for 30 days, but different, uh, different exercises of fast. It actually just ended uh, this afternoon. And thinking of those 30 days, it's been something I've been trying to just grow in my prayer life. And he's like, man, that, that's what I, my desire for you as, as my people was that when you come together for worship, that's a place where you can commune and talk with me. He said it's a, intended not just to be a place where you commune, but where everybody for all nations, doesn't matter your ethnicity, your background, your, your secret sins of your past. Instead, I want that to be someplace where you can come and be washed clean, a place for all to come, not set, a, not set apart because of ethnicity, income brackets, uh, brackets or segments of society. I love this about our Jesus. So here's the thing. He comes in, confronts sin. The question is, how do they respond? Well, we saw that in that section. It says, And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him. Destroy is even a, more, a stronger word than, than, than kill. They want to annihilate Jesus for they feared him. It's kind of cool that it shows a, a glimpse of the heart of actually the, the root issue behind the scenes is they feared him having power that they could not stop. Why is that? Because all the crowd was astonished or, or drawn to or, uh, or, or uh, fascinated with his teaching. There was something about the authority in which Jesus spoke that the masses were drawn to. And so they wanted, as we're told there, to destroy him. If you think about him, if you think about it, this life comes down to our response to when, what happens when we're confronted in our sin. Think about it. Isn't that the gospel message? The gospel message is telling us, hey, you have fallen. You can't fix yourself. You, you need rescue. And the question is, how will we, 
and this, this going into this triumphal uh, entry. How do we respond when we're confronted with our sin? Some people dig in our heels and say, I'm not guilty. I'm not, I'm not responding. Some people actually allow that to break through to get to our hearts, realize, man, I, I, all I can do is to plead for your mercy. All I can do is to call out for your rescue. And that's what Jesus, that's what broke his heart is because he saw ahead of time how so many people will have dug in their heels like the scribes and like the Pharisees and would not respond to the simple rescue plan that he was about to offer. I don't know. I found this passage just this week and spending some time in it. It's really neat to see what was compelling Jesus, obviously compelled by love that he was coming to offer peace. He's not coming to rub our, our noses in our sin. He's instead coming to, to offer rescue. He, he sees our hearts. He knows the difference between fans and followers. He's a, and, and then he cares about us deeply, enough to compel him to cry. And then the last one, which I think is so important, that he didn't just settle for a coddling kind of love. He calls us to change. He wants us to come as we are, but he's called us not to remain as we are. Thanks again for spending some time with us. Let me just pray as we wrap up. Lord Jesus, thank you again for this chance to be in your word and to get a picture of this demonstration, this ultimate demonstration of your love. As you described, there's nothing that paints a, a clearer picture of what we're called to than the sacrifice for a friend. My prayer and my hope is that we would emulate that even in our week ahead, God, that we would make choices to elevate others, to not just be about me, but to think through how can I be uh, elevating and prioritizing the service of others, God. We thank you so much for not just what you taught us, but what you modeled for us. We praise you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.